and welcome to this week's look at action and stunts on film and television. How are you? Good to see you again. Thanks for dropping by. Um, you'll know from the podcast we are looking at Death Wish 3, the third instalment of the Paul Kersey shoot 'em up that started back in 1974. Um... Nothing's changed, particularly. The premise of the whole thing is still the same. Kersey being a character, either the lead character, as in the first two, or a uh, supporting character, really, in the third, because he, in this particular movie, is going to visit a friend of his, um, who evidently he was in the war with. There's some background there. His part of New York is being terrorised by the Creeps, who all seem to dress like the village people, for reasons better known to somebody else. Um, a great deal of unnecessary amount of leather and chains. For me, you know, I mean, uh, what you want your creep to dress like in your own world, well, that's entirely up to you. But for me, it's a bit too much, I think. Um, and so consequently, he then goes on the rampage to put right what has been wronged including a character from a previous movie, um, the uh, the lieutenant, who's played by Ed Lauter, who turns up in most of these situations uh, as a, you know, either a good cop or a bad cop or a not so bad cop or a maybe in the middle cop cop. That's, that's his job. And he takes the story along that little bit further. Action-wise, you know, when I saw it, when did I see it first? I was... Um, I was 13 in 1985 when the movie came out and uh, wasn't able to go and see it. My dad certainly wouldn't have taken me, but we had seen Death Wish 2. We hadn't seen one. We hadn't seen the first one because that hadn't come round to our video store by that time. Um, in fact, I think I probably saw Death Wish, the first one, about 20 years ago. That's how long ago it was before I saw the whole thing. Anyway, uh, so uh, Death Wish 3, we then waited until it came out on video, which wasn't that long, to be fair. Um, and we got it, we watched it at home. As a family, we watched it at home. Because for us, um, it was... I was going to use the word family viewing. For us, it was family viewing. It's a Charles Bronson shoot 'em up You know exactly what you're going to get. Uh, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Charles Bronson's in the movie, therefore predominantly everybody in the movie is going to be killed by him, with the exception of one or two people. So we knew that going in. Um, also, I was excited because... Um, just trying to decide if... Stunt Challenge 85 had come out by that time. Yeah, I think it probably had. And so was aware of Rocky Taylor's involvement and so wanted to see what had happened there. And, of course, the, the, the interesting thing from my point of view uh, was that the way in which it had been talked about and the way in which we saw uh, later on, of course, on the news footage um, from the event and the court case was very much the fact that this was, you know, a life-changing um, accident which it could very well have been very simply and it has been more or less you know he's not he was he was 40 rocky was 40 when when uh when uh this movie came out and he was at the top of his game you know absolutely at the very top flight of his game he was um always in everything that Whenever there's a television or film production, big film productions, he was always involved in. He was coordinating. He was doing all sorts of bits and pieces because he was at the top of his game with all the other top flight performers who were working around that type of time. And then to suddenly get cut down in your prime um, is harrowing. And to come back from that is remarkable. And he has many, many people to thank, of course. Um, I managed to... to um, get involved with Rocky much further down the line when we co-wrote his book uh, Jump Rocky Jump which is still available in the stores you know folks go and order it why not if you haven't read it read it it's a super read it's terribly well written you know <clears throat> anyway um, but um, I think it's certainly worth looking at 
from that point of view and again as i was just saying initially i've got momentarily sidetracked that's not like me at all is it uh momentarily sidetracked was the fact that what i was fascinated about seeing in the film was how much of rocky's you know accident they showed and they showed the entire sequence because obviously he's only he's only injured when you when he when he drops out of shot but that footage that's kept in the film is crucial um obviously crucial to the subsequent court case and um the fact that canon films and uh johnny evans who was the special effects man were were um were taken to court and were sued accordingly and it's, it's it's so you know it's got a whole bunch mixed bag of stuff firstly it's an action flick it's a good old-fashioned charles bronson shoot em up action flick it's directed by an idiot i mean there's no two ways about that michael winner is a horrific terrible human being and and sadly um you know i'm not the only person that said it i'm not the first person who said it i won't be the last either he's been dead years and yet you know whenever his name is mentioned or whenever a, a a film of his comes up or something comes up people go oh god you know they have like brain freezing oh no anything but that because he still has that extraordinary effect on people which is terrible absolutely terrible the fact how he as a director was able to do what he did to other members of the cast and crew very clearly was a major factor in this accident and subsequent others having taken place whether it's on this production or others um so we we want to take a look at what's gone on in the action um it's taken me a very long time to get to this stage, really, as far as identifying a bunch of people is concerned. There, there, now, there are uh, a great many sequences which I just can't cover for copyright purposes, right? I've tried to do the best I can. I did try to upload something to um, uh, YouTube, oh, nine years ago, probably, could even be ten years ago, and um, it was left up for a about 48 hours maybe a bit longer and 72 probably at the push and then removed you know on the basis of copyright uh, globally now things have changed i've managed to obtain you probably see this and some of the quality of some of the sequences that i'm using they are from varying different sources, but that's the only way that I've been able to put together a collection like this and uh, let YouTube go, yeah, okay, fine, and upload it. So um, um, I'm grateful to them for doing that, and, and hopefully it will shed some light uh, on some of the remarkable moments, uh, remarkable action that takes place in the picture. Um Stunt coordinators in the UK, certainly, uh, Mark Boyle. Um, in the States, there was Harry Madsden and uh, Ernie Orsatti. So they did some filming in the States first. Um, there's a sequence which, I, which I'm, again, I'm not able to cover, but um, there's a bunch of guys uh, trying to break into a building and the owner of the building comes out, a woman with a broom, and she throws the guy through a window and off a parapet down onto the floor. Somebody, Another couple of guys have been shot from trees and from an adjacent building. So all of that stuff was done in the States, and that is uh, uh, Ernie and Harry are responsible for all of that. I've tried to focus predominantly on Mark Boyle as the coordinator, the British side of this. As I say, majority of this was filmed uh, in Lambeth, the old uh, Lambeth Hospital uh, plot. And, uh, you know, fair play to um, to the production design team who have come up with some remarkable sets. Bear in mind, the set itself is more or less just two roads at a T-junction, and they've built round it uh, and have come up with some terrific sh uh, sequences and great shots, even brought a graffiti artists from New York to uh, try and give the whole thing a bit of authenticity. And um, I've always enjoyed it. Um, I, I, I've always enjoyed it because, you know, I'm, I'm very aware of those individuals who are taking part in it and uh, I've tried to highlight them here where I can. Uh, if I've missed anybody, let me know in the notes and apologies up front, but I've tried to do as much as I can with the cooperation of those involved. And, uh, with that, we will start to take a look 
at Death Wish 3, and here it comes. So, the third instalment starts with the jail fight. And, um... Big George Cooper is always on hand with Clive Curtis on this particular occasion to pick Charlie up, bring him over to Gavin O'Hurlihurlihy and give him a right good pasting after they've got some themselves. Everybody's having a go. Dougie Robinson's in there as well, just next to Georgie there at the moment. Bit of stomach action. Bang, bang, rabbit punches. And then you can have that. And then he's grabbed from behind. On the right-hand side, Ray Ford. Stuntman Ray Ford. He'll pop up again a bit later on. Your man's taken out. I mean, it looks like a fairly, you know, easy laid-back thing. And then the next thing you know, Georgie's back in him. I don't know. Now, Bennett. Bennett is the guy who is the friend of Charlie, who uh, Bronson goes to get in the first place. He's got this huge machine gun. I think he's got the bullets loaded incorrectly. So, consequently, they all come up to grab hold of him, take him. He gets one, tries to get the other one, and then gets carted off down the stairs. But it's not him. It's our old friend, Jack Cooper, who's doing all of the hard work here, which involves going out over that balcony. Thinning the herd, which uh, is a phrase that Charles Brunson can be heard to say. So he takes this, the brown image, look, this whole shooting all over the place. Motorbikes going down, there's Rocky Taylor going down here. And... We'll have a look at some of the footage behind the scenes. Take a look at this for a moment. It's very interesting, very interesting. Look, now, watch the guy here. He jumps and he goes right, right, and lands right on top of Val Mazzetti's motorbike. He's got nowhere to go. Absolutely nowhere to go apart from down, poor sod. Now, here's the rest of the action on the picture. And we start, there's Steve Wyman right in the middle there. who's just about to get his comeuppance at the end of one of these. Ooh, unpleasant. He only killed two people with that. I think he's fired about 30,000 shots. In the middle is Val Mazzetti. Getting blown to pieces. Up on top is Stuart St. Paul. I wouldn't sit there like that, Stuart. That's going to cause trouble when you get shot. Oh, he's gone. And also Steve Wymant, uh cracking for this because he's got a spotted early. And there he goes. Oh, nicely done. Now, motorcycles, tip tipping. Uh, Colin Skeeping, Jazza Jays, Rocky and Ray Ford on the bikes at the front. Look, throwing that. There's the building that Rocky will ultimately come from. In the meantime, Paul Heesman's going to fall off here with a little vault. Hey! And over he goes. Rocky does a fire gag in this uh, picture as well. This is him set ablaze. Powerful stuff, eh? And then Simon Crane, stunt coordinator extraordinaire, is... Get shot there, look. There we are. Now, this is a nice little gag. So the motorbike's coming down the road. Uh, left to right, Val Mazzetti, Tip Tipping and Terry Forrestal. Tip goes off the middle. Terry bounces along the curb. They all got shot on the way down. That's Mark Boyle, the coordinator. Coming towards him is Rocky, who then lays the bike down. Way lovely. And they all get shot in the process. Not the sort of neighbourhood you want to live in, really. But they're all very happy. My little kids are happy about it, too. Tip Tipping, just about to get an eyeful. I thought it was a nail. It's not. It turns out it's a knife. Uh, when the board comes up, pleased with himself, goes in, up it comes, whack. Look, there's a knife handle on it. And there he goes. Over the top comes Tom Delmar. He's going to try and break into this building. Nice and easy. Drops himself down. Crowbars the door. Oh, and there's a fella behind it. 
and look at the way he comes down the stairs. Absolutely spectacular. A lot of great stair falls of late, but look, back in 1985, Tom Delmar, genius. Love that. So they go, look, we're not having this, and they go and petrol bomb the building. Out first, after that big explosion, is stunt woman Elaine Ford. She comes out on fire. There she goes down the stairs. And behind her in the edit is Tim Condren. Comes down covered in flames as well. Just get Elaine going to the bottom. There we go. Out through the window, Paul Heesman again. Doubling Angel, I think that character's name is. He goes through that rooftop there. And that building on the left has already been blown up. This is much later on in the picture. But he's out. This is Ed Lauter, the guy I was telling you about at the top of the show. And uh, he takes a pot shot now at an oncoming motorcycle ridden by Lex Milloy, who ends up in the post box. Whoa, the back end comes right round and he goes, oh dear, ragdoll, as he ends up in that. Very nasty. Now, let's look at Rocky. So, you can see there Rocky's involvement in this. And it leads up to this particular sequence that we're going to have a look at now which of course is the is the is the fire sequence so i wanted to highlight it put it together slightly separately so that we could i want to give you a bit of feed up to it if you're not aware of it the sequence you're going to see uh, motorbikes have gone by ironically rocky is riding one of the motorcycles that throws the petrol bomb that ignites the building in the first place right so he set fire to the building which he will ultimately jump from just for perspective because they film it in different ways so that's what's happened the building is ablaze and rocky is on top of that building on the lower level you will see tom delmar jumping down and with him is jazza jays now the two of them they jump down into the pit it's not an airbag it's it's a um, a pit it is a submerged pit and there are boxes and there are mattresses on the top rocky will be jumping from 40 feet more or less um and the plan that mark boyle had took him through originally was that this is where you're to be that's where your landing area is going to be from there. You'll take off from this point here and the flames will be gas pumped, uh, i.e. the flames will be able, they'll be able to control the flames. They move them up and down and up and down at the flick of a switch. Um, so the flames will come up to here. Um, they will go back down again. We will then, you'll go forward. The flames will come up behind you you will jump and then they will hit the switch and the building will be exploded behind you as you fall be very exciting and they'll catch you you'll you'll land in the pit down there so that was the plan should there be a problem he said and you've got to go through this every time because mark as the coordinator he's not only responsible for the uh, health and safety of the performance he's also responsible for the health and safety of all of those people around and with communication to varying departments. So they all need to know that if there's an issue, there is an escape route. And he's worked out an escape route with Rocky. Says to him, when you're here, what will happen is that if it gets too weird and you decide, bugger this for a game of soldiers, I'm off, here is your way out. There's a set of steps here at the back. You can get to this point here. It's been cordoned off so you can find it. And then you will climb your way down and away you go. Right, so that's you there at that point. If it gets to that point where you don't think you want to do this anymore, uh, Rocky's a professional. He knows full well that when the camera goes action and there's nothing really preventing him very much from getting to his finishing point, you've got to go. You know, that's the important thing. But this particular gag, it was very clear that from the moment that the cameras were rolling, there was an issue. And you see it in the picture. The fact that those flames are 15, 20 feet in front of it. They are no longer being pumped by gas. So that's a limited gas system which provides gas to the fire for a limited period of time. right? And that ran out very quickly because everything else now is ablaze. 
Why is it ablaze? Well, in rehearsal, and there was a rehearsal at a, a different location, but there was a rehearsal. This building was to be demolished. There was no two ways about that. But in rehearsal, uh, Michael Winner <laughs> had taken the uh, special effects guy, Johnny Evans, to one side and had said, right, show me what you're going to do. And obviously Johnny had rigged this um, uh, location, this, this particular item, to be blown up and wanted to show winner the extent of what was going to go on so he's done it he said lovely that's fine super however that's a really small explosion i don't want that small explosion i want big i want better i want more bigger flames more excitement big 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 not like that now if if that's what he wants super and he would then go right logically speaking what you would then do under that instruction is you would go to uh the other departments and you would say right change your plan he wants it bigger he wants it much much bigger which means the flames are going to have to be higher and we're going to have to pump fuel onto that fire at the bottom to keep it going and to make it bigger which means stunt guys you are going to have to have take more precautions here you need to know more uh, fire guys you need to know this etc there's lots of other departments that need to know um, set builders for instance they have constructed this building right that's not a real building they've constructed it for the purpose of of being demolished and it will withstand you know certain amounts of treachery and torture up to a certain point you know you throw the world and his wife at it in fuel and try and burn the thing in two seconds flat it's going to go up in a pile of, it's not going to not going to last very long this sequence is supposed to last a certain period of time and on the on the foreground of this there is also action taking place uh there's a film crew here there's a fire brigade here there's other people there's vehicles coming by there's all sorts of stuff happening at the same time as in the background, the building is ablaze and people are jumping from it. So it's a foreground, background thing. Would that um, Johnny Evans had have explained that to him, maybe it wouldn't have been as bad. They could have had uh, precautions in place. They could have looked at it slightly differently. It could have worked. Rocky may not have nearly lost his life. That's the key. But it's all on the basis of one man, the director, Michael Winner. So, Rocky is up in position. He knows what he's got to do. He knows where his landing area is. He's happy, right? Action. And all of a sudden, the building explodes in front of him. He's on, he's on it. And now his, la his takeoff area is now 15 to 20 feet high flames in front of him. The heat is ludicrous he can barely see, there's little shots of him on the top of the roof as he's looking over the side and he's thinking to himself you can see him working out where the hell am i going to go here how do i get from this point to down there without losing my life i i know the landing area is over there somewhere but i don't know where and because i don't know where i don't know how far to push but bear in mind they have they've not this has not been rehearsed the jump hasn't been rehearsed right He's done 40-foot falls before. But this is a submerged pit, and on the basis of the instruction that he's received and the instruction that Mark Boyle as the coordinator has received, they are of the impression, small flame, rocky jumps, blow it up behind him. But it's already gone up, and now he's in the middle of that. Thousands of degrees of heat. And he's up there, and he's desperately trying to find a way to get off that roof successfully before the whole building collapses and he's on top of it. And he gets to that point where he decides, I think I might have to bail on this one, and goes to his escape route at the back. And it's no longer there because it's disappeared. It's burnt away through the sheer heat of everything that's happening. He now has to crawl back on his belly, on to the, the, the nearly the front, stands back up again, is now start having issues with breathing because he's inhaling all this fume and, and toxic stuff that's happening all around him. And he's decided, I've got to run. I've got to run and jump off that roof. It's probably in that... Probably. He, he has to say things to himself like, it's probably in that direction there. If I jump, I'll probably make it. Because everything in here now is just... It's gone completely. All of those options that he had in place as a professional 
all of those options and escape routes and plan B's have gone completely. He's now got to make a split second decision to jump in that direction and hope for the best. And that's exactly what he does. He runs through the flames. He puts his hands up to his eyes, up to his face. He goes through and then starts to fall. And as he starts to see where he's going, he realises he's going to miss the landing bed by about three feet. And you go, three feet, really? Well, he's going to land on it with his right leg, but his left leg is going to land on to the ground. The hard, solid ground in September. Cold September of 1985. So when he jumps, he's half on and half off. The injury sustained, broken back, right, firstly. Then his pelvis snapped, secondly. A number of ribs, punctured, broken, lungs gone. And all of the left-hand side of his body is shunted up because of the, the impact on the ground. So consequently, he's had so much trouble because of that since. Now... His return to fitness is remarkable. And the fact that he's working these days, you know, on various projects and all sorts of stuff is, uh, you know, just uh, the the mark of the man, you know, a tick in the box to say, well, you are pretty special, my friend. You really are. And to come through all of that. But he had to go through all of that, which was unnecessary. He didn't need to go through that in the first place. And it's simply because of one man, the director who wanted everything better and bigger and didn't care what happened to anybody so that he would get it. And if you read the book, there's a chapter in there about Michael Winner turning up at the hospital with a cameraman, a photographer taking photographs and putting his arms around Rocky and saying, oh, you can't do anything to me. I'm a director. You're nobody. Look, who's going to believe you? Unbelievable. And so to try and explain that to you, trying to make you understand when you see the footage, it's all over like that. But it happened. It was all over like that. And then there was years of extraordinary problems that he had physically in order to get through this. So take a look at the sequence and uh, we'll join you the other side. Damaged apartment building. There are great sheets of flames rising from burning buildings. The fire department is there, but the buildings are collapsing. I can see fires over 20... So Rocky leaping from the top of that building. Look at the flames, the flames everywhere. And through it in silhouette comes our man. There he goes. And they put a car in front to hide the landing area, but he can't see where it is. Flames are so big. Fire is so hot. All the ambulance crews, and look, they're dragging him away. Tom Delmar and Jazza were first on the scene because they left from the floor below. It was just unbelievable. And all of those injuries, back broken, pelvis broken, I'm in a proper state. Look, he's on the roof there and he can't see where he's going. And all because... All because the director said, well, we'll just have it a bit more. So it's a remarkable job. It's kept in the film. I mean, I don't know. I think it should be kept in the film. You know, he's done the job. But uh, the extraordinary trouble and strife that he's had to go through to get to that point, it's ridiculous. But that's the action, though. Right. There you go. You are now up to speed on everything we know about Death Wish 3. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I want to thank everybody for their continued input in that project. Um, uh, Rocky Taylor, obviously. Um, it's a great thrill to know him and to call him a friend. It's uh, fabulous to watch that stuff and, and be able to tell the true story of that. Um, Tom Delmar, I want to thank him very much for his input on that. Um, I also want to thank Elaine Ford, um, for doing her little bit as well, and Lex Malloy, 
uh, all very kind in uh, putting their two penneth in and saying, ah, you know that, that's so-and-so, and they were helping me out with certain bits along the way. Uh, so my thanks to them, uh, my love to you and to all at home. Thanks very much again for joining me. We'll do it all again next week, shall we, with something completely different. Uh, don't forget to check out the Pod Dojo Network and uh, all of the stuff that they do in bringing together not only the podcast, but all of the other projects that they have. And until next time, it's bye for now. Thank you.